Well, welcome to the podcast, uh, Pit Stop for Life Change. My name is John Steigerwald, and I am with the organization, the North Carolina Boys Academy. It's a ministry of Teen Challenge, and we're kind of relaunching this podcast. It was, uh, we had a podcast about several years ago, but we're relaunching it again, and I'm delighted uh, that we're here in our studio with one of our alums. He's a graduate of our program here, and it's Evan Hughes, and so I want to welcome you here, Evan. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm glad to have the opportunity just to sit down, have a conversation. Well, yeah, we, we, I'm delighted too. You know, <laughs> not only you're alum here, yeah, but you also went home for like what six, six seven, seven months, months. yeah, something like that. You came back in the summer of 2023 and decided mm-hmm. to help out with summer camp treetop right. adventures, and then something happened. You decided to say, you know what, I this is I I, I want to stay here. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that decision making process. Yeah. and I got a couple of questions for I want to sure. chat with you for about. sure. Yeah, so one of the big things was when I was when I went home for the six, seven months, you know, your son Jamin introduced me to the Navy SEALs and everything, and that was one of my goals. I wanted to become a Navy SEAL, and obviously I had some lung issues, and that contradicted me yeah. getting into the Navy and Navy SEALs specifically. And so when I ha- heard that news, I came down to work the summer camp, like I said I was going to do, with that discouragement of not being able to become a Navy SEAL at the moment. And so that door kind of closed, like that door of opportunity closed for me. And then when you brought up uh, Project Timothy, right, mm-hmm. the further leadership and character development and also ministry development uh, that you leadership had to offer, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, that just kind of put a light in my mind almost, just kind of a spark came up. And I just ke- kept thinking, you know, I had that ministry. My parents, grandparents always told me that that was something they saw me doing in my future. And I never really thought of it as mm-hmm. that. And then when I heard that opportunity come up, I was like, wow, God, like you really want me to do yeah. this. Yeah, so some special forces, right. desires, yeah. and dreams into special mission right. of transforming young men's lives. I mean, you're one of the products of this ministry. Yes, sir. You, know, you came into our program, and so we appreciate you being here. I yeah. mean, you're just a phenomenal leader here, and we're so grateful for Thank you. your commitment to this program and the uh, Project Timothy program. Right. That's a discussion for another right, day. Right. But why don't you just talk to us a little bit? You know, there are parents listening to this. I mean, mm-hmm. they're in the valley of decision, right. making a decision whether or not they're going to place their son in a program like this or yeah, maybe yeah. another program. You know, Teen Challenge has over 80 organizations here in the U.S. We're only one of several adolescent right. programs. But if you were to uh, talk a little, a little bit about your relationship at home with your parents and kind of what led them to make a decision to place you here at the academy. Yeah, so I'll share a little bit about before NCBA and then after. So before, I mean, it was started off with my mom passing away away at the age of two, Mm -hmm. right? And at that time, I was in shock, two years old. You don't really understand much things, especially somebody leaving your life, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I grew up throughout my life thinking my stepmom, which my dad remarried at the age of five, when I was at the age of five, um, I thought that stepmom was my birth mom when she came back. And so I grew up my childhood believing that and thinking that. And as I got to the age of about nine or 10, my parents sat me down and explained to me, you know, this is what happened when you were at age two, your sister was at age four, right? Mom passed away. And at that age, I kind of just put up a wall. And I just- Like like what happened? I, just, mean, I mean, just a flip of the switch, really. It was just kind of a, you know, just, I'm not, I can't trust them. They lied to me my whole life. I can't follow those people. Why would I follow somebody who led me down this path? That was my mindset then. And I kept getting older and older. and. I had to put the pain somewhere, and my parents, and we all had a relationship with Christ. I guess you could say I was raised up that way. So you were brought up in a Christian home, right, right. church going, right? yeah, and and you and you would consider yourself a believer at that. Right, point. I was okay. a believer, but I wasn't a follower. I guess is the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. And I believed that there was a God, but then I always had the question: Well, if there's a God, then why did He take my mom away? Mm-hmm. And that was my big question. So mm-hmm. I went along the path of you know, if that God is so true, then why did He put me through the pain that? He put me through, right? Mm-hmm. And so I had to put that pain somewhere. So I decided to go into drugs, alcohol, um, abuse, and those types of things, substance abuse. And that really took a handle on my life, a control over my life. Mm-hmm. And throughout the time, my parents, they would try to reach out. They would say, you need to stop. You need to do this. Let's get you into counseling and everything. They said, I kept going to the fact that I can't trust them because they lied to me when I was two years mm-hmm. old. Mm-hmm. And like looking back, like they didn't lie to me. They were helping me. They were protecting yeah, me. They were trying to facilitate. Right, I mean, right. I can only imagine for your dad, the pain. A lot. It's crazy. He went through a tremendous amount of pain in that. Yeah. And, uh, and so like, how would you characterize the relationship once you found that news mm-hmm. out? Yeah. Um, and you started using drugs yeah. and, you know, uh, 
trying to cover your pain there because right. you know all addiction dwells i mean pain that's what starts yeah. it right someone doesn't wake up and say oh, i'm going to be an addict right? yeah. people just don't do that right but what happens is they begin to experiment there's an anatomy of how an addiction develops right but you start experimenting you start using and then as the frequency increases that's when you really step over the line into right. addiction but Share a little bit about some of the characteristics of, of relationship with mom and dad, because there, there, there are moms listening right now, yeah. and there are dads listening right now, and and they're living through a horror right now right. With, with, with their sons. So, so what characterized your relationship with your before parents? NCBA? Yeah, before NCBA. Yeah. So, really, what characterized it was it was anger, it was shameful. I was disgust. I was all of those big six emotions that we talk about. And I was sad. I was in distraught. I was. I didn't want to re- reach out to them because I felt like I couldn't trust them. And the big issue was they kept trying to reach out to me. They kept reaching a hand out to me. Other family members, my uncle, he reached out ha- hands to me, but I wouldn't reach my hand back you out. Just rejected it. Right. Just rejected it and put it to the side, thinking I knew what I was doing. I knew how to live my life, and that's what I thought it was. I yeah. thought I could live my life my way, not the way that God wants us to live. Yeah, just fast forward now to yeah. the day that you arrived here yeah. at the academy. And it's a 15-month program. Right, right. Uh, you went to school here. You yeah. went to U- uh, on, online. Yeah. Liberty University Online. Yeah, and uh, and then you came into the program. And yeah. we like to characterize this as leadership and character development. Because sure. your story is your story to tell. Right. It's not me. To, I don't tell your right. story. Uh, and when you got here, um, you pulled up. And, and, and what happened? Yeah, I remember driving up. My dad told me a couple months. There's a lot of basketball there. I like basketball, so I was like, "All right, it can't be too bad." And I get there, and then you hop in the car, and you look at me with this big smile on your face. You were like, "Hello, my name is Pastor John Staggerwald. I'm here to help you out and deal with some issues in your past." And I just looked at you. I was like, "How how possibly could you be smiling right now?" Like that's my thought. That was my. This is your horror, right? This right. is the last thing you. I was like, right? I was like, what the heck is happening right now? Like this guy's getting in the car, telling me, you know, I'm here to help you and everything. And it was another. Another time that somebody reached their hand out to me, but it was a little different because you looked at me and you said you have a hundred percent trust right now, and you said that I'm I'm here to help you. I'm here to uh-huh. give you what you need, but also here to benefit you for a life transformation in your family and everything like that. Yeah, and it was a different type of reaching a hand out that I was used to. Yeah, I try my best to whenever any student comes here to meet them because they're at a right. point of crisis. And then right. Jared Niedermeyer, he comes into the car. Mm-hmm. He's our CSAC. He's yeah. a certified substance abuse counselor. Right. So he he's like a, a grand father figure. Yeah, he sure. hops into the car. So you got me in the car with you. Yeah. You and got Niedermeyer, Niedermeyer in the car with yeah. you. And, and what does he tell you? He just, he tells me again. He told me he was like, I, I understand your mother died when he was at a young age. And I just broke down. I was like, because I never was able to talk about that. I never would able to bring that up. I would uh-huh. just start crying and breaking down. Uh-huh. So that was the first step that I really took on somebody asking me about that and bring it to the light and me having to express how I felt about it. And then you got into your orientation. Yep. And you started to learn right. uh, the discipline here. Yep. This is, you know, some people think this is like a military no. place. This is not a no. military academy. This is, I characterize this as, uh, it, it's a family, it's a community, and we know, and you know, from from just being here, community is such an important part right. of recovery. It's yeah. an important part for life, right? The five sure. to thrive, a place to belong, yep. a place to receive and give, recover from malfunction, right. recover from failure. Um, know what your maturity level yeah. is, and then stay true to the identity that Christ that has, given, Christ has yeah. given to you. So talk to us a little bit about uh, that third one, recovery Beautiful from failure, failure, and how critical is that for your journey with the Lord and your recovery? Right, so I know this one book that I, I haven't read personally, but it's uh, Failing F- Forward by John C. Maxwell, and it talks about failing forward. You, everybody's going to have failures. Everybody's going to have mess-ups in their life, but what do you do with that? Right, you got to, one, you ace, right? Assess, choose, and execute. You assess, oh, I love that. What yeah. is that again? Ace. So ace. Assess, choose, and execute. Uh-huh. So you assess your situation, you see that you failed, and you own up to it. You own up to, to I failed. You take the responsibility. And once you do that, you reach out to those around you. You get that community that you were talking about, that place to belong. You, we have that here. And it's a place to belong. It's a place that people love and also, you know, discipline at times when that is needed. And so you find that community and you reach out. You say, I, hey, Pastor John, I messed up. I failed. And I, I need help. I can't do this on my own. I mm-hmm. can't do this on my own strength. Mm-hmm. And that's where you go to community and, more importantly, you go to Christ and to find it where he can help you benefit from that failure. And as walking forward with your failure, yes, you might take one step back, but you have the opportunity to take two steps so forward critical, with that failure. Isn't it? So critical. Yeah. And it's really how we receive the grace of God, right. isn't it? 
I mean, it's it's taking ownership, yeah. taking responsibility of the thing that we need to own. And as we turn to God, God gives us dispenses, grace, right. grace, and mercy right. in order for us to overcome. And yeah. grow. Now, I remember your first parent visit here. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> it was such a growth opportunity, it wasn't was. it? Can, can you just take us through? we got a few minutes left. Yeah. And uh, just take us through that because I believe that was the pivotal point. You had been here for three or four point. months. Three or four months, yeah. And really you had indirect communication with your parents because right. that's what we do. Right? Yeah. So we want to – mom and daddy get some recovery time. Yeah, for sure. Because life is – Need a pre- break. They need a break. It's chaotic. <laughs> yeah. And then your parents come for the training. They arrive on a Friday night. They meet the entire community. We share a meal together. We get to know each, uh, uh, each other. Yeah. Then they do. we do some training with them because that's what makes our program unique. We right. just don't say, hey, there's a magic wand for junior. There's no here. magic wand. There's no, no magic wand. It's a family – It's it's about the family and mom and dad right. learning how to, yeah. you know, for to change too. Right, and going through so, the same books that we go through. Yeah, the same books you go through. Yeah. And so they arrive, the time comes on Saturday morning, and yeah. you come in and take it from there. Yeah, I, I walked in the back door at the dining hall, and I saw my dad and mom, and I was like, Phew, and I knew it was going to be a battle. And I walk up, and my dad reaches out a hug, and I just kind of push him aside. I mm-hmm. said, I'll shake your hand. I'm not giving you a hug. And it was my mom and my stepmom, and I was like, all right, I'll give you a side hug or whatever, right? We sat down at the table and they started talking, asking how I was doing and all that. And I just really, I just looked at the wall, said yes, no, didn't really answer the question. And all of a sudden, my dad started crying. And he, he started, dad was, yeah, I remember that right, was, all right. I saw was that someone just, yeah, it was like streaking across, across right. the dining hall and going into the bathroom. Right. And my and wife it was got at my that, attention. It was at that point where when I saw my dad crying, I couldn't take that. So I looked over to Miss D and I said, I need to, wow. I need a break. That's interesting. You can, yeah. I, well, his it was the first time, right? His vulnerability to—I mean, it showed how much he loved, how much he cared for mm. me. And when I ran into the bathroom, I had nowhere to go. You came in there, you brought my dad in there, and it was the first time in my life that I had to face the issues. I didn't have the weed to go to. I didn't have, you know, any anything to go to materialistically. I had to actually face the issues in my life. And I mean, I was weeping. My dad was crying. It was wow, just a, remember that. a emotional Special bonding moment. time, right? It was, I mean, like you said, the turning point I really see in my program where I was able to see my dad's vulnerability and how much he actually cared and wanted to do for me because that courageous step of giving up your son for 15 plus months, right? Like, that's a lot. I can't speak into that because I'm not a parent, right? But, like, for my parents, I know that it's so hard, mm-hmm. so hard. The hardest decision my dad said he's ever made mm-hmm. was to give give me up to people that he met maybe two, three I, months ago. I remember when your parents came here for a visit we gave him right. a tour, and I remember your dad crying. I remember yeah. That how vulnerable they were right. and how, 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 how much great love they had for you. Yeah, it was no. like, and, and, you know, still I have. That, yeah, they still have for you, yeah. you know, I mean, he's only built on that. Right. And, uh, and so as we near the, just the close of this, um, what would you say to a mom and dad, or right. maybe a single mom that's listening to this podcast, she identifies with some of the things that you said and you mm-hmm. shared about her son. He, your son may be 13, 14, 15. Right. I don't know. And she's got to make a decision yeah. whether or not she picks up the phone because any parent that calls this ministry, North Carolina Boys Academy, or any other adolescent program, right. that's a courageous move. Yeah, it's the first step. It's the first step. What it's would you leap say to them? What would you say? Well, I know I've talked to people on tours and things like that, but the main thing that I would say is you're giving up your son for 15 months, right? It's almost like a time of – it's a time of sacrifice, but it breeds a lifetime of success. Say that again. A, it's a, a time, time of, of sacrifice, but it breeds a lifetime of success. And so that 15 months, it's yeah, you're sacrificially giving over your son for that amount of time that he's not going to be living with you. Yes, you'll have communication, have past, and things like that, but you're really breeding him to the young man that you feel that God has called him to be. And that's the biggest thing is that you're taking an opportunity, you're taking a chance, and you're looking at this situation as an opportunity for your son's future, for that relationship to be restored. Because, like, I know for my parents, this was the last step. They tried the counseling. They tried, you know, getting uh, police involved and things like that. Like, it never worked. And so it's the, it was the last opportunity that my parents saw that it was just like he needs the help. He needs, he needs something that we can't provide for him. Mm-hmm. And so when they found that out, found this place out, I would tell the same person, uh, today, like you said, a single mother or two parents, grandparents, or whatever it is, that is an opportunity for your son to be successful in life. Because I didn't have hope when I came in. I was lost. I was I had nothing. I had nowhere I was going. I wrote a paper about the 10 tools that I, that I live my life by. And one of those was that before here, I didn't know where I was going to be in 5, 10, 15 years. I had no idea. And like now I can see where God's leading me to be because of the place 
this place, North Carolina Boys Academy, and the work that not only myself but my parents put in because it's a two-sided ball game. Uh, the student can't put in as much work as he wants to, and the parents just sit back and watch. Yeah, for it to be sustainable. Right, right. So, so Evan, um, having been here in the academy for 15 months, right. you did a 15-month program. Sometimes yeah. a student is here for 16, 17, 17 18 months. Correct, for sure. Sometimes they, re, they uh, receive a setback because of some disciplinary right. reason. But, you know, we teach a lot about life here and mm-hmm. about stages of life and maturity yeah. and growing into right. adulthood and maturity. Um, and you've been a part of those classes here. If you were to kind of distill it down to three things that you learned here that are serving you now and impacting your life, what would they be? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is a place to belong. And it's so much community. more community, right? And especially when a student graduates, right? If they go into, like my family, they did everything they could, right? They surrounded me uh, biblically with biblically men and women in my life to fill me up with the areas that I needed. Went to a private school. I had that community I had. Might have not been the perfect school, right? It might have had their ups and downs like all schools do, but I had that community. I had that place to belong, the place I could reach out, cry to, and also have a laugh to watch some ball games and also just dive into the word with. I had that community. That's the biggest thing to carry that I will carry for the rest of my life. Yeah, having a group to thrive in, right? Not a group to switch up and have that chameleon lifestyle where you're, you know, some people act one way around you than they will around, you know, somebody else based on who's around them, right? So that's the big thing is to having a place to belong. The second thing I learned is the, in the life model book that we go, um, go by the living from the heart that Jesus gave you is on the maturity stages. Mm -hmm. And uh, chronologically, you can be, you know, age 13 to uh, birth the first child you're in that adult stage and chronologically you could be 15 you could be in that adult stage but mentally you can be an infant emotionally stage. right emotionally infant stage, you can mm-hmm. be an infant stage child stage whatever it's at and so it's like as I go throughout coaching here and also like with my siblings back at home walking them through that book walking them through the same material that y'all gave me and passing along that seed because you know I gained the seeds I gained the things that and I'm still gaining I'm still learning every day so and now I'm giving now has right. the five stages as yeah. infant child child adult adult parent and elder, elder right. each one of those stages are driven chronologically yeah. so but you also, could be in a parent right. stage and be 45 years old but yeah. still have Infant, infant kind of right. tendencies emotionally, and I think Paul speaks about that in the in in, in God's word quite right. quite quite often there. Yeah. So, so what would be the last? The, thing? the last one was just your relationship with Christ. I mean, I can't do what I'm doing now without a relationship with, relationship with Christ. And another thing, I love going back to the Life Model book, but it says this in chapter one in, of wholeness. It's a day to day expression of our salvation, a day to day expression of our faith. Wow. And to go back each and every day to dive into the Word, to have that time in prayer. Right now we're on a 21-day fast, right? And it's that even more of internally, last week was internally searching, letting God search us and point out the things in our life that we need to work on. And now it's praying for those supernatural things to happen and things like that. And But it's even more so, not doing it because it's a fast, but doing it doing it because I'm building my relationship with Christ. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing yeah, with no us, problem. Evan. Wow, you're, you're an amazing young man, and uh, I love thank doing you. life with you. Yeah, yes, I'm grateful that you're on our staff here as a junior coach right. and uh, looking forward to many more days ahead sure. that we can serve together and impact sure. people in, in the kingdom of God. And this is your host, uh, John Steigerwald. I'm with the North Carolina Boys Academy. I serve as the executive director. This is our podcast, Pit Stop for Life Change. If you have a son or a daughter that's struggling with any of the things that we, we spoke about today, you know, Teen Challenge has centers all across this nation. And if you... Uh, have a need with your son, just call us here at the Academy and the information will be shared with you later. But uh, we're here to serve. And uh, thank you for tuning into this podcast, Pit Stop for Life Change.